Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on you will surely have wars. Can somebody pray? Father, we thank you for your grace, God. We thank you just um, for the word that um, is going to be brought forth, Lord. We ask you to sensitize our, 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 uh, our spiritual hearts, our spiritual lenses, God. Just Help us and give us ears to hear, Lord, uh, what you're saying to us right now. Um, help us just to um, be um, fervent and, 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 um, and sober in hearing God and alert in hearing, Lord, that we may hear your word and be changed today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Y'all can sit down. Uh, this one may lean in the preach direction. I try to avoid that on Wednesdays, but it is what it is. Uh, the other day I was reading uh, this text, this chapter, uh, and came across one of the... Uh, following verses which says and Asa in the 39th year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great yet in his disease he sought not the Lord but to the physicians and Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign so I made a Facebook post with that exact uh, verse um and ultimately what it's saying is that he got, he got a disease. Uh, he, rather than seek the Lord, he sought the doctors only, which I'm not telling you not to seek the doctors, but if you skip over the Lord and you've dropped the ball, it shows that he went and died. So uh, I was already there uh, looking at this chapter and everything. I went to read to the kids last night because I like to try and uh, read some things to them and then ask them a couple of questions and then briefly explain before they go to bed. And uh, so I thought, I'm just going to go back to the chapter that's already opened in my Bible app. And uh, they may not understand the thing that I'm fixing to say on Second Chronicles, but I just feel like I need to read from there. So I went back and uh, I read to the kids and I came to a point in the chapter which got my attention and I knew that there was something that God was wanting to say. So sure enough, I do see it. And what I see is very simple. Uh, it is not deep revelation. It is, however, an on time word for sure that I know that God would have us to consider. So I want to look at it again one more time. I'm going to read it to you again from this same translation here. This is the New American Standard. The reason I use it is to read to the kids so they understand. I'm not reading to a three-year-old out of the King James. I hate to break it to any of you that are hung up on that one translation. But it may be the best, but it's just flat out silly to try to read the King James to toddlers and expect them to understand. So I use another couple that I've, I've researched. You know me, I go for the Greek and the Hebrew and all that. And I make sure certain things are safe. I know that there's other translations that all out together omit certain scriptures and certain words and whatever else. So I'm not endorsing certain translations. I am, however, saying that the King James, I don't believe, is the one and only one you can open with that. You know, there's other things to be found in other translations. So I use the New American Standard, which I'm not going to say is faultless, but it is good for reading the kids. So when I was reading it to them last night, I, uh, I came across... This verse, again, they got my attention to begin with, but it did even a better job under this translation. So I'm going to read it to you again. It says, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have war. Did y'all hear what it said? It said, The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. In other words, what it's saying is, is that God has the intent of seeking the earth and looking upon the earth and supporting and defending and standing faithfully for those who have given their hearts completely unto them. I said the Bible shows us here in this text that God is going to support and protect and stand for those who are sold out to him. This text goes the extra mile in speaking to whoever it was speaking to, saying, you've done foolishly in this. In other words, you've not really done this. This has not been who you are. So what you can expect now is wars. It says, from now on, you shall surely have wars. In other words, this is what I see. I see the text saying 
that God intends to fully uphold and to protect those that are sold out to him, that has gone all in and given their hearts unto him. But for those of us that have maybe backed away or grown stale or grown cold or allowed a little bit of distance in our relationship with the Lord, indeed that is a foolish move and because of it, we should expect uh, an increase of wars, an increase of turmoil, an increase of problems. It's a no-brainer. But I want to show you some things as we move on, and hopefully it will help us uh, think differently. This text, it either belongs to you, or it does not belong to you, or it belongs to you, and you're not aware of it yet. Because complacency is a slow fade. Do you hear what I'm saying? Amen. Look at the slow fade in the seats around about you right now. Complacency is a slow fade. Falling away from intimacy with Jesus is a slow fade. And sometimes you don't see it until it's nearly too late. The text says, I want to read it to you again. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. I want you to look at what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. And we can go there right quick if you want. And then consider the significance of what it is that he's saying. Revelation chapter 2. This couldn't be any more of a simple word, but I'm telling you, some of us need to get a hold of it and really consider. Revelation chapter 2. And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Now, did you notice what he said? He said, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and they're not, and have found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. In other words, what, what Jesus is showing us when you consider Second Chronicles 16, which is our key text. What we're really seeing here is that it's entirely possible to continue in the work of God and to remain active in the things of church or whatever else and to feel like everything is in order while growing cold and in, in, in intimacy with Jesus. That it's entirely possible to still go through the motions of what's expected, to still, to still attend church and still, and still go through the motions of singing the songs and doing what you feel like you ought to do and going home and cracking the book open sometimes and sitting down and praying a little prayer over your food and whatever else, but miss the very point of intimacy with the Lord. What does the text say, our, our key text? It says that God's eyes are really upon the earth and he's looking throughout the earth so that he might uphold and protect those whose hearts are fully given unto him. He's saying he's going to guard and protect and uphold those who are given unto him fully. But those who do not give themselves unto him fully are making a foolish move because in that they can expect an increase of problems in their life. We ought to know that, but maybe we don't see it. But then when we look at Revelation chapter 2, what we see is a clear rebuke unto a church that was active. They were still doing things that seemed great. They were the all-fire church at a time. They were the ones doing the things that looked right, seemed right, smelled right. You couldn't tell it necessarily by looking at them. But God was saying, I know your heart is not fully given unto me. You are doing things and you're walking through the motions. But I don't really have the intimacy with you that I once did or that I would like to. And therefore, I'm calling you to repent. the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Amen. So he searched the earth to identify some people 
who have gone the extra mile, not just to claim his name, not just to have a form of religion, not just to pop in at church when it's convenient, especially, especially on a Wednesday night. Let's not do that. But to find those whose heart are completely given unto him, who are sold out to Jesus so that he can go the extra mile in return and say, I'm going to make good and sure that I support these. He's faithful regardless in Christ Jesus. I don't want you confused with, with doctrine, but there's a special blessing, if you will, for those that are intimate with the Lord, that go all out with the Lord. There's an oil that's broke at the feet of Jesus that you do not experience in any other place. There's an intimacy that's around that most people never experience. A lot of people, they have some measure of a religion. They have an emotion and a commotion. They've got something they're doing, and it makes them feel like they're qualified. And in the actions that they're doing or the things that they, are taking place in their life, it makes them feel as if, well, I'm dotting all the I's and I'm crossing all the T's. I read three chapters today. I prayed over every meal, didn't miss a beat. I thought about Jesus a couple of times, etc. And the truth is, you could go through all of these things like the church at Ephesus and not for a moment have intimacy with God. Amen. And it's in the place of intimacy when your heart is sold out unto the Lord that God's eyes are upon the earth saying that one there, that one, I've got a deep relationship with them. That one there, they lay this down and that down for my sake. They fast and they pray when everybody else is watching the TV show. This one here, I'm going to completely uphold. I'm going to strongly support them because my, their heart is sold out unto me. And because of that, I shall protect them. So some of you, obviously, you've got things in your life that you're going through. Certain things, you're like, I'm getting hit, I'm getting attacked. I'm getting beat down, I'm getting overcome by literally everything that comes my way. I don't know what to do, I don't know how to get my head above the water. Every inch I, uh, I make in progress is a mile I lose in defeat. And I feel like I'm not getting anywhere, I'm spinning my wheels. And if this goes on much longer, I'm surely not going to make it. Because it's only getting worse. I'm trying my best and it's getting worse. And I want to tell you right now. That there could be a lot of components to that, but I got a hunch just based upon what the Lord showed me, knowing who would be here and who would not, that he, this word that he gave me is a word that somebody needs to hear and know of this, that a lot of the wars and a lot of the problems and a lot of the things that you're going through in your life and a lot of the things you're facing right now are the very result of the fact that your heart is not completely given up to the Lord. And now he's calling you like the church of Ephesus to repent and come back to your first love. Nobody would surely admit that but me. Why do you think you gave me the message? For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Amen. How many of y'all know what that really looks like? I challenge you before you step out on them and go ahead and say, yes, that's me, that you evaluate that. Because it's a high calling and it demands sacrifice. It doesn't just happen just because. It doesn't just fall into place just because. It doesn't just happen because you believed upon the gospel and now you're going to heaven. None of that is just by default. You believe upon the gospel and now you're saved. You have an eternal home. You're secure in Jesus Christ and he intends to keep you. But at the end of the day, it does not it does not say for sure that you have intimacy with him. It does not mean necessarily that your heart is sold out to him. There are some 30, there are some 60, there are some 100. Where are you today? Because I'm going to tell you, a lot of what you're facing right now is resolved in intimacy with the Lord. You're trying to pick up the slack by doing more. You're trying to pick up the slack by uh, filling in the gaps with more religious actions. When the truth is what God is looking for is somebody to lay at his feet and have a heart to heart. He's wanting to know you. You're thinking maybe if I do a little more and add a little more to the agenda and if I have more of a rap sheet spiritually and I'm doing a lot of things. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there's no other church listed other than the Church of Philadelphia in the letters to the seven churches that did as much as this particular church. Amen. They were active. They were fervent. They were getting the job done. And if you were to ask anybody that saw them from the outside looking in, you would say, it's a really concrete church. When they come in, they actually worship. When they come in, they pour their heart out. And when they go out, they go out the door and they talk about Jesus. They listen to the Christian radio. You'll never see them sin. You'll never hear them say a foul thing. They treat everybody great. You're like, this is the best church possible. And yet Jesus comes and says, I know what's going on in your heart. And you've not completely given it to me. And I say this right now because I want to caution you. Because a lot there's a lot on your plate. I'm speaking directly to somebody one-on-one -on -one right now. I don't have to know who you are. 
And I'm going to tell you, you've had wars. And the, the text says they shall surely come. Meaning they will surely come and they will come in abundance because your heart is not completely given to Jesus. And these things have nearly overtaken you. You've had so much on your plate that you don't know why. And I'm telling you right now why. Because you've become a Martha rather than a Mary who's busy, but yet you've missed the better part. That you've done all the things you feel like you need to do, but yet where's the head on the chest of Jesus having the heart to heart with the one that created you? Where is it? Nobody wants to hear this guy talk right now. Because everybody believes they're, they're, they're top tier. They know behind closed doors they got grievances and they cry to the Lord and say, God, what's wrong with me? And then they come to church and they put a face on and say, I'm doing pretty good. God knows. And this is not a rebuke. This is just a, an answer to your problems. This is to tell you how to escape one war after another, after another, after another, after another. They will continue to come. It is written. They won't stop coming. The answer is that you may be found in the secret place of the Most High that you might abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. The answer to your war problem and the things coming against your life and the issues that are attacking you and the things that have fallen on your plate that are too much to bear is not necessarily you doing this more and doing that more and going here more and going there more and putting more in the bag and all of that. That is a good thing to do, but it's not a good thing at all if it's not for the right reasons. And God at square number one is looking for intimacy from you. He's looking for somebody that will take their heart and offer it unto him 100%, not holding anything back, no compartments, no you can have all of this, but you can't have that. He's looking for somebody who will give their heart completely unto him, and when you do that, he has promised in return to uphold you and to fully protect you and to stand on your behalf, and you sit and watch. As you do that, as you develop in relationship and intimacy with God in a way that most people are going to ignore. Most people are going to hear this message. They're going to lay it down. They're going to go back to their religion. They're going to carry on with the same ignorant dogmas. They're going to do the same boring things, show up and sit in the seat, go home, be dead. They're going to read a little bit if they feel like it. If it's convenient enough to turn the TV off, I'm telling you, this is the Spirit of the Lord. If it's convenient enough to turn the TV off, then maybe they'll open the book. Maybe they'll open the app. They'll read through it a little. When they pray, they pray a little eight-minute whimper, which they're begging God to take away the wars in their life. When God say, I'm looking for you to have intimacy with me, and then you won't have to come to me all the time about the war. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, we go, we get complacent, we back away, we fall away from intimacy with God. And when we do, everything hits the fan and we feel it. So then when we come to God, all we really come to Him about is the very thing that's going wrong in our life. And then because we become so complacent, we fall away in a sense, we become too carnal to actually pray without falling asleep. So all God ever hears from us is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please help me, please help me, please help me. And there's no intimacy. I'm speaking truth and I know it's falling on planks. I don't have to have an amen. I know it is. Think about it, man. You're created for this very purpose. To have communion and fellowship with the Lord. Why do we fast? To lay down the flesh, to destroy the flesh, to get it out of the picture. Not just so we're super spiritual, but so that there can be a unity in the spirit with the Lord that that's far exceeds anything that the rest of carnal religion will ever experience. The majority will never step into what I'm talking about right now. And therefore, their life will not come into alignment with what God wants for their life. Amen. And this ultimately has nothing to do with your life. And everything to do with the giver of life. And you having a one-on-one, -on -one, realistic, deep, fully, fully heart-given everything you can to the one who's formed you. Does anybody understand what I'm saying right now? For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth. Right now he's looking. Right now he's in the house. Of course he's in us, but I promise you he's omnipresent. He can walk the aisles just the same. He ain't like a devil. He don't necessarily need a host in order to walk the earth who formed it. Amen. And I'm telling you, what does he see when he walks through the swinging doors right there? And he looks over at Nikki. And he looks over at George. He looks over at Tony. And then what does he really see? Because I'm going to tell you what he's looking at. He's looking at whether or not your heart has fully been given unto him. If it's completely his. The truth is, most of us 
we have our hearts so divided. A little bit for Jesus, a little bit for this, a lot for that, that being self. He goes on to say, you have acted foolishly in this. Meaning you've allowed some distance to be formed between yourself and the Lord. You've allowed life or the cares of the world to pull you away. I'm telling you it's a slow thing, man. You could have a fervency in a moment and just over time. And you not even see it because it's such a slow fate usually that you don't recognize it until it's, it hits you right up in the face. And you realize that, man, I've allowed life and the cares of the world or this, that, and the other to slowly pull me away. I promise you, go hit the thermostat and put it on 60. It's going to take time for it to get there. It will not go from 70 to 60 in an instant. You probably won't even notice it until finally you're actually froze over. And you're like, who turned the thermostat down? And I'm telling you, it's no different in your spiritual walk with Jesus. That he's looking for somebody that completely gives their heart unto him so that you can burn with the fire and the passion of the Lord. So that you don't pass through this world complacent and cold and then have a war every day all the time so much that it's rendered you ineffective in the things of God but most importantly it's severed in, in any kind of real intimacy with the one that you're formed to have intimacy with the Lord says from now on you will surely have wars in other words your life is going to be filled with issues and turmoil and struggles and problems and failures and constant attacks from the enemy and all of that sort of thing because your heart has not been hidden in the secret place of the Most High. Your life is going to be filled with issues and problems and turmoil and wars and failures and constant attacks because your heart is not hidden under the shadow of of the Almighty. It's not because God's going to send a bunch of wars into your life. It's because you don't have intimacy and therefore the wars come and you can't stand against them. If you had intimacy and you were tucked away in the very heart of God under the wing of the Almighty, then when wars came, what would, they, what would that matter? How would that fare against somebody that's intimate with God? How would those wars look in your life if you were positioning him in a place to where you poured out your heart at his feet and you were in love with the one who formed you. Or you can let the cares of the world drag you away. You can grow cold on Jesus. You can continue doing the things that you feel like seem right. The things that everybody else does still go to church. As long as you're showing up for church, nobody's going to think you've got a problem. You know, keep doing the things you feel like you should be doing. And before you know it, you'll convince yourself that that's enough. Knowing good and well that there is no level of intimacy there. And because of it, your life is a wreck. Your spiritual place, where you should be spiritually, is not what it could be or should be. If it is, you don't have intimacy with the Lord. You can't separate the two, man. Amen. If you're not in that place, that secret place in which you're at the feet of Jesus, pouring your heart out with the Lord, knowing Him and He you, why do you pray? When you go into the prayer closet, I promise you, if it's for the sole purpose of rattling off a list, God, I need this, help me with that, touch this person, whatever else, amen, shut the door and walk away, then you can't possibly have intimacy with God. If that's what your prayer sounds like every time, please pray that way sometimes. But if that's all God hears from you, that's not intimacy. Listen, prayer is not for the purpose of us just petitioning our need. Prayer is fellowship and communion and conversation with God. It should be a dialogue. There should be a back and forth. You should grow to know his voice. Just because you may not know it yet don't mean you're not here. His, but your, his sheep know his voice. Eventually you're going to grow to know it. How are you going to know it apart from intimacy? When you go into prayer, obviously you list the things that you need and you pray for the people that need prayer. The Bible says to pray for all men continually to pray. But at some point in time, you've got to lay those things down. I, let me tell you what I do. In the mornings, I pray for my family. I pray for my kids. I pray for the church. I pray for the people in my life. I pray for my coworkers. I pray for all of those people. I pray for all of the needs I can possibly think of. So that when I go to pray at night, there is no mention of George. There is no mention of Tony. There is no mention, mention of my coworkers. There is no mention of nobody. When I go to pray at night, I took care of praying for all of the needs in the morning. So when I go at night, I can lay at the feet of Jesus and say, how are you doing? I praise you. I glorify you. Thank you for your great grace. And just get into his presence and have fellowship. Me and him. 
no business, no talk about everybody else and everything that's going on. Just me and him have a fellowship and intimacy and growing in our heart to heart. Amen. I'm telling you, man, you cannot do this thing without it. Your life will be a train wreck disaster with one thing after another that you can't figure out how to beat. And I promise you, if you go to God for the purpose of just figuring out how to beat it, you've still missed it. Forget trying to beat it. Go and get to the one who loves you and get to know him. Give your heart completely to him. Amen. Lay a thing or two down. Live a sacrificial life, why don't you? To cut the TV off for a minute. Get into the book and see if he don't speak to you for a minute. How about instead of eating three, four, five meals a day, you kick back the plate two or three times and say, God, I'm fasting because I want to sense your spirit a little more. How about we get into the presence of the one who formed us and get to know him and he us and lay at his feet and worship and praise. No agenda, no laundry list of things we need or things we want to see God do and just come for his sake and then see if his eyes don't go throughout the earth and then they land on Patty or they land on Kitty and they say this one here has given me their whole heart and I'm going to stand for them and ain't nobody going to touch them. When the wars come to be a small thing because their heart it's fully given unto me. So I'm going to tell you now, man, if that's who we are, we're going to see a life change. Amen. This is the very bottom line for why we're created. The very bottom line. And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Amen. What did he say the greatest commandment was? That one. The rest of them are a wash if you miss that. Seriously. They all hang on that one, Jesus said. If that one falls, there's nothing hanging. Who cares if you're not committing adultery at that point? Who cares if you're not stealing from the grocery store at that point? They all hang on this one. If I knock down the clothes hanger, everything hanging on it falls with it. Two through ten. What is it if you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart? What does it even amount to? Who cares if you're keeping Saturday Sabbath if you don't love the Lord your God? Does anybody hear what I'm saying right now? Joshua says to take diligent heed to love the Lord your God. Take diligent heed. Psalm 31 says to love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth, preserveth the faithful. Or in other words, he keeps from the blunt end of chaos and wars those who are sold out to him. I'm telling you, man, I've faced some things in my life and I've had to fight through some things and I've had to wrestle through some things and whatever else. And it was entirely the result of the fact that I had allowed my heart to pull away from a place of intimacy with Jesus. And some of you might say, well, I'm just saying I can't seem to catch a break. Somebody knows what I'm talking about right now. I can't catch a break. I try my best and nothing seems to work. I'm always under attack and my family life is a disaster. I've been, I've been struggling with sin upon sin upon sin. The reoccurring sin one after another. All the while, even though you're still praying and you're still going to church and you're still doing all the things you think you should be doing and you're trying to continue doing what you think God is well pleased with, your burdens are compounding. You fight one war upon another war upon another war. And every fight that you seem to fight, you know as good as I do, leaves you in a place where you're a little bit more beaten down and you're a little bit more downtrodden. And then you begin to start wondering if anything's ever going to come together. And then you believe the lie of Satan. Well, it's just how it is until we get to the by and by. That's not true. It's true if you don't sell out to the Lord like we're called to. Amen. What did Jesus say in Matthew 10, 38? In Luke 9, first, he says that you are to take up your cross and follow him. Amen. Ultimately, that's to lay your life down. and get, You would have to lay your life down and have a heart for the Lord, to give all unto the Lord in order to take up your cross. But in Matthew 10, 38, he says that anyone who does not take his cross is not worthy of me. Amen. Jesus says, I am looking for a people that will give me everything that could possibly give me. What did he say to Peter? Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you a God pay love me? Would you die for me? Would you lay your life down? Would you cut the TV off long enough to get with me in prayer? 
Would you come to me long enough to not sit and give me all your problems, but to have intimacy with me? Are you willing to have the sweet hour of prayer, Peter, or are you going to fall asleep in the garden? When I come to you and you come to me, can we have that kind of fellowship for at least 60 minutes uninterrupted with no request asked? Can we just have a heart to heart for an hour? Because I'm going to tell you that's what I'm looking for. What did Jesus say in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's sweating blood and his disciples are sleeping? Could you not pray with me for even an hour? In other words, do you not love me enough to actually have that kind of intimacy with me? Are you like the rest of them following me for the miracles and the food and the provision? Are you chasing me down because you need something from me? Or did you come into this garden, the place where we walk in the cool of the day with God? Or did you come in here with me so that we could sit and chat? I know your problems. I know the beginning from the end. I am the ancient of days. I know what you're up against. I knew before you asked me what was going on in your life. These are wars that have come because you've not given your heart unto me completely. But when you do, when you can come into this garden, you can join me in a time of intimacy and forget about the rest of the world. I promise you these wars aren't going to seem like a thing anymore. Amen. I'm speaking to somebody now because I know you've had a lot on your plate. You've had a lot on your plate ultimately because you know that there's a complacency developing in your walk with Jesus. You know there's a coldness that needs a re-stirring, a, a fattening of the flame. You know it. But I'm going to tell you it's not going to happen through begging God about your laundry list. It's not going to happen through telling him all your problems and what all the kidneys problems do. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen when you go and say, you know, I'm sorry. I've allowed this complacency. I've allowed these things. And I've come to lay my head on your chest just to hear your heart beat. Now speak to me the words of heaven so that I might know who you are. And then give me your eyes to see that I might see how you see and feel how you feel. I want to know you for who you are. I want to go into a place in which there's true intimacy. I am not interested in religion. I'm not trying to go through the mechanics of what seems right. I want to know you for who you are. I was created for no other reason. If I don't eat for six days, that's okay because I got to feel your touch and I've got to hear your voice. If everybody else mocks me because I don't go to that perverted movie with them, that's okay because I got to hear your voice and I got to feel your touch. If everybody looks at me like a fool because when we sit down in a company meeting, I say, hold up. We're about to pray unto the one who is good. And then I make everybody in there, drunk or not drunk, pray with me because I love you. And so be it, but that's what I'm going to do. Does anybody hear me? God is looking for people in this hour that will take their heart and say, Jesus, it's all yours. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'll come to church by myself and I will sprawl out at your feet at 530 while everybody else is trying to figure things out. Because you are worth the sacrifice. I will tell the people of your goodness and of your grace and it will not be a burden unto me because you are good and you are worthy and I love you. of digging your heels in. It's just not. The answer is found within returning to your first love. Amen. And some of you have no idea what I'm even saying. But I'm going to tell you this. Maybe you've never had that kind of intimacy. Maybe you've believed and by faith you've been washed in the blood. You know you're saved because there's a, a something bearing witness within your heart. But that intimacy is a level which is something you've never entered into before. How would you do it with your husband or your wife? What would you do? You would go out of your way to get their attention. You would go out of your way to get their attention. I promise you there's times where I sit down on the couch and I work every day. When I go home, I probably don't work. Open the computer and I get to work. There's times where my family would probably like me to close that computer, put it back in its case. They'd be like, you know what, this can wait. Because you're more important and I love you. What do you think God's looking for? If intimacy is developed with a human in a certain way, then how would it be developed with God? Go to him. Lay down the distractions. Whatever is hindering you from entering into that place, put it away. There's no science to it. It's a matter of taking your heart and saying, here it is. I don't know how to do it, but I know this. 
I want to go as deep as I could possibly go. And then you begin to recognize around about you everything that stands in the way. Feelings you have towards people that annoy you. That's one that I'm having to deal with right now. I'm trying to work on that. Get that put away. Issues that stand in the way. Being too busy. Too much going on in your life. I've got a reminder on my phone right now. And I'm just speaking with you now because, again, I'd rather you get help than hear a good message. I have a reminder on my phone right now that says, make a, uh, make a plan for discipline. And all it means is, is make a schedule just to practice for a few days. Because after I get used to something, I will, uh, it'll become a thing. Meaning, pray in the morning. Find time at this time. Do a little time in the Bible. Uh, work out a little bit at 3 o'clock because you're getting fat. All of these things, because they do matter. This is the temple. When your temple gets out of shape, then you're going to have a hard time communing with God because this is the temple. And the sensitivity to the holy place is hindered by the outside. I know that's a hard word, but it's true. So I try to put down the eight Oreos a day and pick up the dumbbells. I'm serious. I just bought $50 dumbbells that were $200. I got them on sale. So I thought, I'm going to really start applying myself a little bit. And I'm still waiting on weights when somebody says, there's going to be one. Some weights. <laughs> point is this I'm being intentional and deliberate about making life changes that will force me into intimacy with the Lord the things that have been hindering that and standing in the way I'm going to directly attack them and make sure they leave my life the things that I've given place to maybe it's YouTube for an hour even if I'm listening to rapture dream videos I don't care what it is even if it's God related and I sit there for two hours and I'm consumed by that. Maybe it's good in a sense, but what happens at the end of the day when I'm tired after those videos is 10.30, 11 o'clock and now I'm ready to pass out and I've missed that nighttime intimacy that I just told you all about because I was consumed with watching videos on YouTube. Intimacy says, and discipline in that intimacy says, I can't let that happen. I've got to cut this off early. I'll save this one for tomorrow and this one because that's probably pretty good. Save it for tomorrow, lay it down, and then go in there and get the feet of Jesus and pour your heart out. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? I want to look at the familiar story of Mary and Martha real quick and we'll quit because I'm trying to hurry and I've rambled for a long time. Do you want to play something super, 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 super light? Or you just want to sit there? I don't care either way, I guess. I just thought it might be good. Luke 10, starting at 38. Luke 10, 38. And I'm telling you, this is so important. If you didn't have the first war or the first problem in your life, it's still important. More important than anything you'll ever do. More important than anything that you'll ever face. Any job, any amount of income, any sickness or disease or trouble you go through, any house foreclosure, bankruptcy, I don't care what it is. Give me anything you want to. There's nothing more important than intimacy with God. And if any of it is standing in the way of that, then figure out what to do about it. And rearrange things so that you can have that kind of time with him. So you can develop in intimacy with God. So Luke 10, 38 says, Now it came to pass, as they went, that he had entered into a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was covered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she may help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So Martha's still doing servile work for the Lord while she's missing opportunities to develop an intimacy with Jesus. Amen. Now, Mary, on the other hand, you know, just knowing the times and knowing the nature of people and the nature of the book, you know that she's still cooking, she's still cleaning, she's still doing all of these things. She's not missing the things that Martha was doing. She just knows how to lay them down for a time so that she can get into the presence of God and give her heart unto him. All of the things that you do for Jesus, it's good. Don't get rid of it. Coming to church, it's good. Don't get rid of it. It's commanded, in fact. The book, get in it, consume it, let it change your soul. It's good. 
Increase that. It's fine. It's good. Fast. Pray. All of these things, they're good. Do them. But there's got to come a point in time in which you lay it down and you go into the presence of God and you say, I need to know you. 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 And the power of your resurrection. Being conformable even under your death. I need to know you. There's nothing more important than For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth. That he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Amen. You have acted foolishly in this. Again, he's telling people, where's the intimacy? You've neglected to give me your heart. And because of it, you're going to have a lot of problems. Not because God's mad and he's going to rebuke you with problems, but because that's the result of not going all in with Jesus. It's just the way it is. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. And I find it interesting enough that right after that, we'll find that the man, he got diseased in his feet. He didn't seek God. Of course, he would have if he had intimacy. So he went to the doctor instead, and he ended up dying. What do you think would have happened if he was a God-seeking, intimate kind of person? Got a hunch he probably would have lived a little longer, or God wouldn't have even mentioned it in the book. I don't know about y'all, man, but I've, I've had about all I can to give a place to the flesh. I've recognized in my life certain traits and qualities that are indicators that there's some things that need strengthening. I recognize uh, in, in ways that I've allowed people to trigger fleshly emotions and thought processes that there's things in me that I need to get back to the drawing board and back into the presence of God with. I've recognized in uh, the shortening of my prayers and the lengthening of things that mean nothing, pure vanity, that these things are a reality, but I see it now. And I never realized that really the problems and the wars and the things that I was going through was really the result of the complacency that I had allowed. But I want to tell you this, if me and me alone does nothing else, and you could join me if you'd like, I am going to take heed to what God has spoken unto the church of Ephesus. And I'm going to return to my first love if it costs me everything, which it should. Because there's nothing more important than intimacy with Jesus. I think about it all the time. What happens when you die? If it doesn't matter now, what happens when you die? And what happens when you die early, before your time, and you weren't expecting it? You know how many times I rise up out of the bed? This happens four or five times a week. With my heart feeling like a this close to a full-blown catastrophic heart attack? Five times a week, probably. Can't breathe. Body knows it. The internet says it's heart failure. Probably you need to sleep sitting up. It wouldn't surprise me with the amount of crack and pills that I took, but I know this. I don't want to die right now. Not because I'm not afraid to die. Or not because I am afraid to die, but because of this. I know that I'm not where I should be with the Lord in respect to intimacy. And I want nothing more in respect to death than to be a lot closer to where I know I should be than where I am right now. So I want to spend my life, if I can, and moving forward sacrificially. I want to get back to fasting like I once did. I want to get back to praying in the way that I once did. Seeking Him, and not, not just with Him laundry lists and problems, but I want to seek Him and know Him. And out of that, there's a perfect peace. When your mind is stayed on Him, man, wars just don't exist. It's a non-issue. And I don't know if any of y'all are willing to join me, but man, I'm going all in. I am. I've had enough of the carnal mindsets. I've had enough of the wars. There's nothing else. He is worthy of all I got. Because he gave it to me anyway. You know, Jared, it's really a shame that a lot of people look at the Lord as a genie in a bottle. Yeah. You just go to him for what you want. You expect him to do it, get mad if you don't. 
I mean, instead of loving him for what he's done for us, I mean, he's even done his life for us. Amen. I, f I fear that, that many people just receive it as a story at this point. Yep. There's, there's such an uh, unrealistic, non-personal idea of who God is. I mean, and to be honest, that wouldn't really exist if there was oil in the lamp. Because then you couldn't argue with the presence of the Lord and the goosebumps of the Lord and the electric feeling of His presence. Right. And the clearness of his voice, a lot of that is reconciled with oil, which is the Holy Ghost. But I see it a lot. People have the idea of God. And they, they believe in a distant, just a theological way. There's no real experiential uh, walk with the Lord. I don't ever want just a theological religion that believes good doctrine only. You better believe good doctrine. Don't twist my words. But if your your walk with God ends with what you know, then all it really is is a puffed up disaster. Because right. love edifies. And it's funny because we feel as if if we have the longest possible list that we can have on things that we've done for God, or if we're just doing just enough, then you know what I mean. Like if if as long as I put this 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 and this, then I feel like everything's right with God. And you could entirely miss intimacy at that point still. You're commanded to uh, to be washed by the water of the word. You're commanded to not forsake the assembly together of the saints, to come and be with right. the people of God. That's right. You're commanded. All of these things are commanded. You ought to be fasting and you ought to be praying as best as you can. These things you should be doing, but at the end of the day, none of that equates with intimacy. None of that in any fashion means you've given your heart to God. Because every religious man there ever was in this book did all of these things and yet their heart was far from it. My challenge to you is not to lay down the, the things that you know you should be doing because they assist in growth and they assist in helping you become aware of who he is and understanding who he is. But it's all it is is assistance. You need a one-on-one, -on -one, real and personal, intimate encounter with God. Amen. And then you need to have it again the next day, and then the next day, and then every day thereafter. Because this is a lot more than religion, a lot more than dead letters, a lot more than things that there is to learn. And it's all about a knowing and a loving and an intimacy with the Creator. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for who you are. God, I just thank you for the thought process behind this message because it's caused me to stop for a moment. And I thank you more for the grace to feel conviction. Because truth is, God, when complacency comes, there's a level of searing that follows. And I'm thankful, God, that you know how to take anything seared and revive it. And that's my prayer now, God. If anything has become seared or stale or complacent or cold, ask God for a fresh flame to come upon that and revive it in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, for the grace to sense your presence, a drawing and a wooing back into a place of intimacy. I thank you, God, for a recognition of your willingness to bring that to pass. I've prayed so many times, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to approach it. I have the desire deep down in there somewhere, but no sooner than I reach for that desire, I lose it and I go back to carnality. And I don't, I don't want to live that way. And I'm asking God that you would help me to maintain that conviction. To maintain that thought process that is drawing me back into a place of intimacy. And I pray that for other people in this house too. And anybody that hears this message. God that we would be a people that, that give our heart unto you. Sold out all in in every possible respect. With no strings attached. Not just for the sake of wars dying down and problems going away. But because you're worthy. God if the wars increase that's fine. I just need intimacy with you at this point. I don't care what the result is or if wars are more or problems are more. I just, I don't care at this point. I need depth. I need depth. Father, we love you. Help this people in Jesus' name.